we'll go ahead and uh, get rolling here. Thank you all for coming. I, yeah, I know. it's like uh, when I was a, a professor, this is how my classes would go. Lively discussion, and then I'd start talking, and all the discussion would stop. It would just be, come to a dead stop for the rest of the period. And then they'd start talking once the bell rang again. So, but thank you all for being here. And we, w we will have lively discussion uh, today. Thanks to our, our welcome guest, our honored guest, uh, Franklin Tanner Capps, uh, who will introduce in just a second. Uh, but uh, we're, we're thrilled to, to uh, finish off our foul first Thursday. This is the, the last in our, our series for this year. We had 10 events. Uh, so this is uh, June. We'll pick back up in September. Um, Want to say thanks to Tom, who's, you know, usually I gesture over there to our band, sort of like Letterman gesturing over to <laughs> Paul Schaefer. Uh, but Tom had to leave, had to leave early today, but he played uh, wonderful piano music uh, uh, to play us in yet again. So we want to say thanks to Tom yet again for doing this free of charge, uh, donating his talents and treasures to us as always. Um, and want to say thanks to our friends of the Waccamaw Library, FAL, the wonderful uh, acronym FAL. Um, and we have a, a couple of, of our devoted friends uh, back at the table here, uh, Diane and B. So thank you so much for, for being here. And if you're not a friend, uh, please uh, join up. Uh, they're there to sign you up. Um, so th they're, they're wonderful. Uh, they keep this, this program going. They keep all our programs going, adult programs, teen programs, children's programs uh, here at the Waccamaw Library. Uh, just had a wonderful uh, garden tour uh, and have a, the book sale coming up again. Uh, so this whole auditorium will be filled with wonderful books, nice books for cheap, and that's July Oh, yes, June 30th and July 1st and 2nd. So don't want to miss that and just come away with a, a bucket full of books for next to nothing. Uh, and all those proceeds go back to the library. So, um, so we're very grateful to our, our friends. Uh, and today, uh, to close things off our series for the year, we have Franklin Tanner Capps. Uh, Dr. Capps will explain how political theology views religion as a means of positively addressing certain social challenges, challenges here in the South. He will explore how a decommissioned prison facility in one rural North Carolina town has been reclaimed as sacred space, even as it is a working small farm, a garden, and a community gathering site. Crucial to the project's success are its theological roots that connect the healing of individuals and communities to the healing of the land. Uh, so it's a very important project uh, that he'll, he'll be discussing today and one that we hope uh, can be replicated elsewhere. Hailing from rural Oconee County in the South Carolina Piedmont, Dr. Capps earned his doctorate from Duke University's Divinity School and has served as Bruce Scholar's lecturer in the Honors College at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, just up Highway 17 a bit from us. Uh, Dr. Capps recently accepted an appointment as director of the Miller Summer Youth Institute at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. So he'll be heading up northward uh, very soon after this. His talk today is based on his article, Reclamation and Memory, Theological Roots of decarceration in the rural South, which just appeared in the journal Political Theology, uh, published by Rutledge, a major scholarly press. So we're thrilled to have with us today, uh, Dr. Franklin Tanner Capps. All right, well, thank y'all for having me. I'm, I'm from Oconee County, the other end of the state, and I crossed the North Carolina, South Carolina line, so it's good to be back in my um, home territory. Well, thanks for coming this morning. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background, um, as, as Dr. Turner said, um, to this work I've been doing on political theology and uh, 
community action based around a decarceration group in Wagram, North Carolina. Um, I got started with this work, and if I'm using any language that you need me to like stop and define a term, just pause me, and uh, I think we're a small enough group that I'm happy to explain some terms, but I got involved in this work around 2014 when I moved to Laurenburg, North Carolina to teach at St. Andrews Presbyterian College. Um, it was my first job coming out of graduate school. And when I was there, so Scotland County, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in a second. Um, one of the most economically and politically distressed um, corners of North Carolina, um, right around Robeson County, Hope County, Marlboro County, South Carolina. Um, and I got there and I'm at this liberal arts college, you know, looking around, I, I'm from you know, the, the South Appalachian Mountains from uh, Oconee. And I'd not been in this setting before. I didn't know a lot about it. I didn't know the history. Um, it seemed much older in some ways, and indeed it was. Um, the Lumbee Indian Nation um, is situated there in Robeson County, Scotland. And as I began to explore the history of the place, I met a, um, a, a man named Norrin Sanford, who was a community-based activist who was working with young people um, at risk, formerly incarcerated young men. And I was teaching in the religion department at St. Andrews, and I was really wanting to connect my students um, with action going on in the, the community. It was really an important part of my work and how I saw myself within the framework of the college. And fortunately, I got to meet Norrin. Um, I wish he could be here with me today so he could tell his own story about the, the, the beginnings of Growing Change, this group that I'm gonna talk about. Um, but he and I got to talking and I got my students involved in some of his work. And as I'm going to talk about um, a little bit this morning, the work that they're doing is he's taking a youth team and they are transforming a closed prison site in Wagram, North Carolina into a community center and agricultural space. And I prepared a manuscript. If it gets a little too boring, we'll just kind of have a conversation um, about what's uh, what's going on with Grow and Change. But this work's been going on since approximately 2011. Um, they're in their 11th year of work. Uh, the pandemic has disrupted the, the kind of flow and the energy around the project, but he has nine youth um, working with him now. Um, all of them are youth leaders in the community and uh, the work continues. So I wanna explore um, a few key terms um, related to this work around social ethics and political theology. If you'll just bear with me for just a second, I want to um, give you some definitions. So I'm going to root Noren's work in this concept of political theology. Now, when people hear this term, a lot of times they're like, oh, political theology, that sounds like really bad. You know, like we're mixing up religion or uh, religious affect with political decisions. Um, but I want to kind of make it less scary. I want to root Noren's work in faith-based activism. Um, in the community with a deep root um, in religiosity in, in the rural South. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So let me give you the etymology or the word history of this term political theology. Politikos, um, the Greek term meaning of citizens or pertaining to the state and its administration, or very simply, how do we do public life together? When we show up in this space and we have this community library that we come to that's for everyone, why is it organized the way it is? What, what resources, philosophical and otherwise, go into rationalizing this kind of human interaction? So that's politics in a nutshell. How do we do life together, right? Um, when I walk out my front door and encounter other human beings, how should I behave? What kinds of decisions do I make about your welfare and mine, et cetera, and so on and so forth? Theology, um, rooted in this Latin term theologia, um, it's just an account of the gods. What does it mean to do God talk? Um, it, it literally, theos, God, logia, a word, a word about God. And when we put it all together, what kinds of words about God can we speak in a public and political space? That's what it's about. We carry our religious convictions with us, regardless of our tradition, into the public square, and this is about working out how we relate to one another based on our theological convictions, who God is, 
or we might call it the transcendent, um, the, the something more. It can go by a variety of names in the Christian tradition, of course. We, uh, in my religious uh, tradition, it's God, right? Yahweh in the Hebrew. So words pertaining about God in the public space. I'll give you a few really quick definitions. I'm going to work through this fairly quick, and y'all stop me if you want me to clarify anything. Um, really, political theology has been done going all the way back to Plato, Aristotle, right? They're trying to figure out how does the, the cult, the cultus, uh, my re religious orientation, relate to how I do life with other people in the polis, all right? How are these things organized? But I want to give you this name, um, th this guy, Carl Schmidt, um, German legal scholar um, from the mid-20th century, um, unfortunately becomes, his, his legacy is complicated because he ends up setting up the political apparatus that eventually becomes uh, National Socialism in Germany, very fraught. But I want to point to this key text that was titled Political Theology that he writes, and he has this contribution to philosophy, theology, religious understandings of, um, of public space. And he says, all significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are just secularized theological concepts. Okay. All concepts of the modern state are just secularized theological concepts. And what he means by that, I'm going to read from my notes here, is something like you take the sovereign ruler that is God in the ancient world, right, or in pre-modernity as it's sometimes called. So God is this great transcendent being, and it becomes immunitized in the sovereign. In other words, in the executive office of whatever country, and then it becomes administered. So the president becomes a kind of God in um, Schmidt's view. Um, for example, he says it's the sovereign who can upend the norms of a society to declare a state of emergency, right? A state of emergency that requires martial law or FEMA or whatever, the sovereign can do that. And he says that's a lot like God in the ancient world creating a natural catastrophe, right, that disrupts the settled order of things. So I don't want to spend too, I just want to give a hat tip to Schmidt as this important um, theorist along these lines. So he's, he's the one who writes the book literally on political theology. But I want to get, these are Christian um, resources here. William Cavanaugh, a Roman Catholic. These are much more simple um, definitions, and this is what I'm going to be working with for the rest of the morning. Political theology, Cavanaugh says, is the analysis and criticism of political arrangements so your county council, whatever, criticizing that all the way up to the federal government from the perspective of differing interpretation, interpretations of God's ways in the world, right? And I, we're living through this moment right now where we're, we're, we are revisiting this question anew of what do our religious convictions um, mean when we enter the public space to do things like vote, right? How much of that can I carry into my public life with other people? In the American context, this is where political theology makes people nervous. It's like, we don't do that, right? Why? Well, separation of church and state, at least presumably. But the reality that Kavanaugh's pointing to is actually when we get into public life together, we can't help but bring our deepest religious convictions, even if we don't have any formally into the public sphere. So we're wrestling with this. I mean, this is stuff around the Supreme Court and its activities, um, how Congress is relating to Supreme Court, et cetera, so on and so forth. But how do, we, how do we criticize our political arrangements from the perspective of God's ways in the world? So this is one definition. Here's another one um, by Oliver O'Donovan, um, a theologian that I think highly of. And he says, political theology is the name that's given to proposals which draw out an earthly political discourse from the political language of religious discourse. So let me just simplify that for just a second. All he's saying here is that political theology has to do with what does, what does our political discourse, our life together, tell us about our most deeply held convictions. And what I'm going to suggest to you this morning is that how we incarcerate people, how we treat them when they're in prison, the sorts of policy decisions that we make when we do that, which are still ever evolving, 
right, are religious convictions. How we punish people says a lot about how we as a society um, view the transcendent and view God, okay? So we're going to look at um, Growing Change, this decarceration group out of Wagram, North Carolina, as a group that's trying to do the work of getting young people out of the incarceration system. And I want to suggest to you that says something very profound about their own religious orientation. And I'm going to talk about that um, a little bit in just a second. Let me just pause right here for any questions. Do y'all want me to clarify anything? I know this is kind of heavy theoretical stuff, and I, I don't want to dwell on it too long. But can I answer any questions? Yeah. Yes, our political lives. And then, and I'm also suggesting that how we act, how we behave, how we make major decisions around, say, incarceration, what that reflects about our religious life, um, whether the person who's making that decision has a professed religious orientation or not, but yeah. Exactly. Right. And it's not just the territory of one political party or the other or whatever. Right. Um, we're all at the table having this conversation right now, whether we realize we are or not. Yeah, that's a great question. You're referring to the word political. And we're not just meaning government. We mean public life, our common life together. So we're not just talking about politics as a political party, but it is much broader than that. Exactly. So like what we're doing right now is a political act. You showed up. Right. I prepared. We come here in the shared space and we, this is a political statement that we're making. So I'm expanding it way beyond just policy decision. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, good, good. Other clarifications I can make? Well, that's great. Okay, so this is the sort of basic sort of theoretical infrastructure that I'm operating with. So I want to talk about the human context of growing changes work. Um, I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit. I'm going to try to stay out of the weeds um, of the, the specifics. So feel free to ask me like a policy question. I might not be able to answer it. But here are the three things that I want us to think about as we think about the work of youth empowerment and getting young people out of the incarceration system, which is what growing change is attempting to do. So the three, three sort of broad areas, and this isn't exhaustive, is youth detention, literally like getting, being put in detention in school, in public school, and how that leads to concepts of deviant youth, right? Um, in the late 90s, um, there was all this discourse on the, the super predator child, right? Like what's going on there, these super predators, when in fact, um, you've probably heard about this, in the 90s, crime was in steep decline um, in the 90s, but we had this sort of law and order thing going on um, that really started with the Clinton administration and this rhetoric around super predators. That persists to this day. The other concept is idleness. Um, there's this irony, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a second. There's an irony around putting kids in time out to remove them from social activities when, in fact, the kids who are acting out, this is just, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, really need more social interaction, right? Not less. Right, so there's, there, there's a lot of odd stuff going on with when we impose idle time um, on young people as punishment. And then there's the, the longer history of sort of, uh, of uh, punishment, particularly in the, the southern United States, of work as punishment, right? And here, the, um, the prison site that Norrin Sanford and Growing Change occupy in Wagram, North Carolina, is a direct link, and he talks about this in his public talks, to chattel enslavement in uh, the, the uh, antebellum, prebellum um, periods, right? There's a, I'm going to gloss a whole bunch of history that we're not going to have time to talk about, but the work camp prison of the South, this is in Georgia, Alabama, um, North Georgia in particular, uh, North Carolina, to some degree in Michigan, um, the state of Michigan, oddly enough, the work camp prison has its roots in chattel enslavement. So this is really important stuff for us to be thinking about, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the human context. Um, I wanna to point to uh, this enlightenment philosopher named Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and he, he wrote on education of the young, 
And one of the things that he saw, probably before anyone else, is that childhood needs to be treated as a specific phase of human development. If you're a teacher, you're familiar with this. I'll read a quote from Rousseau. He says, nature wants children to be children before they become men. He's writing in the Enlightenment era. If you want to pervert this order, he says, we shall have, I love this, young doctors and old children. By imposing on them a duty that they do not feel, you set them against your tyranny as a parent or a teacher or whatever and turn them away from loving you. You therefore teach them to be dissemblers, fakers, liars, to extort awards and to escape punishment. So what's he saying there? He's saying, well, look, if you, if you, when you punish a child with a heavy hand, right, you're just going to help them get more creative about how they're going to get out from under the tyranny, all right? So well, what do we do? And his recommendation is maybe a little bit too liberal for Oconee County, you know, so we'll just kind of let them be children, you know, like free range parent them is basically what he's saying, you know, where I grew up, there was a little bit more order um, to things, but he said, let them be children. And I want to suggest that harsh disciplinary punishment techniques, they might in, ensure conformity in the classroom or whatever, right? But they are going to only lead to more dissembling or deceptive tactics among the young. This is just a reality. So in Growing Change's work, they're trying to address this problem. How do you have kids, all young men that the the founder can work with, these young men who have learned these techniques of of, of dissembling, of antisociality, how do you begin to walk that back and undo it, right? They've been so disciplined into antisocial behavior um, that in many ways, it's not all they know, and I don't want to, you know, over-dramatize this, um, but it is part of their formation, right? So Norrin Sanford is a um, behavioral mental health therapist, um, the founder of Growing Change, and part of his work is doing deep work in therapy and behavioral modification through conversation and work together. Um, to try to walk back and undo um, some of these patterns that have been learned. Um, I will point you to, this is something that's fairly disturbing to me. I'm, I want to talk about the idleness question for just a second. Um, are any of you familiar with the Kamari Harrison case in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, from uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic? So here we're talking about idleness in detention. So. Um, My daughter, eight years old, um, in kindergarten at the beginning of the pandemic, she moves to online learning, right? Um, She's got her iPad in in the third bedroom or whatever, and we're trying to keep her in there to do online learning. Well, Kamari Harrison was a um, nine-year-old in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, and he was doing online learning, and in the background to his, uh, in his screen was a BB gun. The teacher apparently saw it reported it to the school administration, and the school administration acted, and this is really interesting. They treated the the presence of the BB gun in the virtual space as if it was on school property. I kind of get that impulse. I I, I kind of, I'm I'm, I'm like trying to be sympathetic here. The the school um, acted and suspended Kamari Harrison, uh, I don't know how many days, I can't remember right now, but he was suspended from online learning in his own house. That's, that's weird, <laughs> right? It's, it, it's very odd. And so I, I was looking at this when I was doing my research on um, youth detention and that sort of thing, and I was shocked. I, I thought, well, maybe, you know, how, how does that work? Uh, how do you give a child detention in their own house, and it's a really weird logic, right? Like, we're going to, you, we're going to punish you for something in your own home, in your own space, but we're not going to let you learn. We just got to sit there, or like, I, I don't know what you do, right? And so, what happened, I mean, now, fortunately, the Louisiana legislature uh, enacted the Kamari Harrison Act, and it put severe restrictions on what school districts can do within a person's home in this virtual learning space, but we're trying to figure this stuff out, right? So the only reason I point to this example is because it's an example of imposed idleness, but it's not just like when I was in middle school, 
go into detention right in another room and I'm separated from my class. It's literally being locked out of learning in your own home. It's, it's odd stuff. So part, and I point to it also to gesture it, the, the community work that Growing Change is doing because rather than separate young people, right, and, and quarantine them in a building unto themselves, they want to bring them together, right? Get them talking about their stories and their, um, their lives and their families, many of them deeply fragmented and traumatized, um, rather than exist in these sort of isolated, hyper-individualist spaces, right? So the work of Growing Change is trying to knit back together what detention in our schools can tear apart. Does that make sense? Um, there's a couple of other, this is just sort of technical incarceration um, stuff, but there's really two, two ways we punish in America um, now. So there's the idleness, right? Put someone in a prison cell, separate them apart for whatever it is, you know, that they've done, right? The other way we punish, do y'all, can I just do a teacher thing and just, do you know the other way we, we typically punish in the United States? Through putting people in debt, right? Um, you find them, right? If you can't pay the fine, then you might end up in idle time, right? You could be um, summoned, right? So it's, it's really interesting. The two forms of incarceration in the United States right now, it starts in the, the school system in some ways, and this is changing. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not being very technical here. Idleness or debt, debt entrapment. And there's a, um, a theorist, uh, I'll call her a social theorist, named Jackie Wang, and some of her work is around what she calls carceral capitalism, the way that we entrap people in debt that they can't escape, right? To punish them, right? To have them repay um, society. And the problem is in many of these cases, right? If you get your $140 traffic ticket and you can't pay it, right? You are in the teeth of the system. Um, and for many of these young people, I know this is a, having been a young person myself and getting my first traffic ticket, that's where it starts right? It can start there. So you get this interesting melding of debt economies and entrapping people in debt with these experiences of detention in primary education. Um, usually these are children's first experiences outside the family or care unit when they're put into detention, or it's their first experience with real economic or social debt when they get pulled over for the broken taillight or whatever, and they have a uh, traffic ticket that they can't pay. Let me pause right there because I'm about to make a transition. Can I clarify any of that? Um, so we're going to get a little bit more into the work as punishment thing in just a second. So this is, the, this is some of the stuff that Growing Change is responding to. Okay, I'm going to move into this. I wanted to give a, a firm hat tip to uh, South Carolina too. And in many ways, Marlborough County is a sort of mirror county, a parallel county um, to Scotland County, North Carolina. Um, these numbers are not precise, and I'm going to give you the definition real quick that I'm working with on what constitutes poverty um, in this analysis. So poverty, um, the definition that um, many people use is uh, a family of four, and this is specific to Scotland County, a family of four subsisting on less than $24,000 a year. And that status from 2015. Um, my wife works in early child care, um, early childhood development um, in Laurenburg in Scotland County, North Carolina. Um, this is real. Uh, this is the real deal. And it is hard, hard, hard work for all involved in the public sector. Um, but we're talking about somewhere around 25% of adults in Scotland County, North Carolina, are living in poverty. So that's a family of four extrapolated out, right, to particular circumstances, subsisting on less than $24,000 a year. 35% of children are also living in poverty in Scotland County, North Carolina. Um, this doesn't change a lot when you get to Hoke County, north of uh, Scotland, and then when you go east to Robeson County, it changes a little bit. So this leads to negative health outcomes, um, a, a, an epidemic of obesity. Um, I was at a conference at Montreat um, Conference Center out in the mountains do, doing some community work. And one of the things that was pointed out, um, actually by Norrin Sanford, who was at the conference with me, 
is this, at one point in time, I didn't know this, that area, that little swatch of um, North Carolina, South Carolina was referred to as the amputation belt because there were so many amputees in that area. Now, part of that is our proximity to Fort Bragg. Um, that's part of it is the, the, the military connection, but part of it too were um, amputations for things like diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So poverty, and we know this, right, but we just have to say it, poverty and extreme negative health outcomes, low quality of life go together, right? Um, this produces all kinds of uh, issues, let's just say, um, in our polis and our life together. So Marlboro County, just to the south, um, growing change is not necessarily involved in Marlboro just because of transportation issues, 30% of the population. So very similar numbers here. So I wanna put this up on the, the screen um, to just give you a sense of the magnitude of the problem. I will say, and, and the reason I really want us to think about this is because in the nonprofit world, in the community activism world, so many resources go to urban centers. Um, when I was teaching, I was involved in a program in Charlotte, North Carolina, phenomenal program, very well endowed, right? And I would, when I would go see my students who I would place in this, um, commun this social justice community thing in Charlotte with the Presbyterian Church, I would come back to Laurenburg and be like, God, we need, we need those resources. Like Charlotte's all right, you know? Um, Parts of Charlotte are not all right, but Charlotte in general is, is okay when it comes to the nonprofit work. I'm sure there are people who want to argue with me about that, but our rural places are suffering mightily right now. And they have been since the 60s and 70s when the textile industries of these regions began to pull out, devastated these economies, right? destroyed the tax base, right? There is no tax base in, in Scotland County. I mean, there is, but it's fraught, right? I mean, to be a county commissioner in these circumstances is hard, hard work, right? Having to figure this out. So I, I, again, I may be over-dramatizing it a bit, but this is the reality. So let's go back to what, um, how, how rural America has incarcerated people. So let me, um, I'm gonna quote, Kimber Hines, real quick, we're going to talk a little bit about the work camp prison. So the work camp prison, uh, this is Kimber Hines, who I believe she's still at UNC Greensboro, I'm not sure. She helped me some with the article that I worked on on this. Um, she writes this, the North Carolina State's Transportation Department constructed road camp prisons and oversaw forced labor of prisoners. Within a few years, most of North Carolina's 100 counties all mostly rural, as you know, if you know anything about North Carolina, most of North Carolina's 100 counties housed a road camp prison. Until the 1990s, North Carolina had the highest number of prisons in the country. When did these start? When did these work camp prisons start? Do y'all wanna guess? Yeah, after the Civil War. Exactly, 1868, right after the Civil War, right? What was the problem that they were trying to address? Well, North Carolina in the Reconstruction era, they needed good roads, right? Um, this is an interesting fact that not, I didn't realize this. Um, I remember <laughs> when I was in seminary talking with a friend of mine who was from North Carolina. He was like, man, y'all's roads suck in South Carolina. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, it never occurred to me when you, it's like smooth in North Carolina and then you drive over it and they're full of potholes and whatever. Um, well, yeah, okay. What he didn't know was that the good roads of North Carolina had been built with prison labor in the post-1868 era, right? Again, the Scotland County Correctional Facility that Growing Change now occupies, that is a place that has a direct link to the reincarceration and entrapment of largely black people, black men, now, there's a, I, I have notes in here on her. Um, Sarah Haley has some excellent stuff um, on, the, on the incarceration of black women, um, particularly in the state of Georgia. That's an important conversation um, that I want to point to. It's not just about the incarceration of, of African-American men, but largely the roads were built in North Carolina by that labor. So it was about the re-entrapment. Let me read you um, 
I believe this is still in the books, North Carolina General Statute 4826. It says this, All able-bodied prison inmates shall be required to perform diligently all work assignments that are provided to them. The failure of an inmate to perform such work may result in disciplinary action as if the free labor wasn't enough. It may result in disciplinary action. Work assignments and employment shall be for the public benefit to reduce the cost of maintaining the inmate population while enabling inmates to acquire and retain skills that might lead to honest employment after their release. So labor, to go back, work as punishment, is still on the books as something that the North Carolina legislature thinks is a good thing. Um, and, I, and this is complicated. I'm not saying that it's not. This actually grew out of a reform, a progressive movement um, across the South where they thought, well, good labor will produce good people. Right? Honest work produces honest people. And the problem with these vagrants right, is that they just don't have anything to do. So we'll give them something to do. That's why they're, they're involved in criminality. Um, this goes, this is actually very recent um, because part of the problem here is what do you do? Like, in the American Register, we want people to be productive, right? Good productive citizens. That's part of our mythology. All right. Um, Kamala Harris, I believe in 05, she put forward in, in California um, a work reform or, lay, or a penal reform proposal that was all about having young people work again. Right. So we've gone back and forth in America. Right. Putting people to work. Um, maybe that's not such a good idea to, to have public goods and services rendered by people who were not compensating. Right. Or maybe it is. Maybe it is. Or maybe we're giving them a skill set. Right. They can carry out into the general public to be a good contributing citizen. So we've been kind of back and forth and you can feel the tension, I hope, in this. What I want to suggest to you is that growing change is trying to overcome this problem between idle time and work time by putting young people to work, compensated work, right, community work, at a place that was originally used for domination, in many of their cases, of their very own ancestors, right? So let's, um, I'm going to, yeah. Cutting stuff, cutting stuff, because I'm going to. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about the decommissioning of the prison um, in Scotland County. Let's see if I... I'll go to that in just a second. So the Scotland County uh, Correctional Center was decommissioned in November of 2001. I'll describe it to you real quick. It's a 60-acre campus, um, actually quite beautiful. It sits on the ridge between the Lumber River watershed and the PD. It's right on it. It's a really interesting little cut in, uh, in, in North Carolina, in the sand hills of North Carolina. It's hidden from view, though. Like, you, you could pass that on the highway and not know it was up there, right? And that was a tradition, it seems, in, in building North Carolina prisons all the way from Haywood County up to Columbia, North Carolina, um, and down to, into Wagram, North Carolina. I don't know this for sure, but I can speculate. Why do you think these prisons were built in largely rural? There's a practical reason, but largely rural communities. There's, there's two reasons, I think, that these were built in these, these places, but kind of hidden. What do you all think? Well, it's because of the poverty of Okay. Exactly. You've got some buffer, right? Like you got some rural um, buff. Yeah, it'd be much easier to catch up with an inmate who escaped. And this did happen at Scotland County Correctional. Yeah, good. Other, other thoughts? Yeah. Exactly. Hidden from view. It's, I mean, it looks like a little college campus almost in a weird way um, up on the hill. But it's hidden. Like you wouldn't know, you know what's up there, right? And actually the sign that says Scotland, well, there's one that is fairly prominent, but the orig when you're coming from the south, north on the highway, you can't hardly see it because it's set back in the woods, right? So it's distasteful, right, to have to actually confront this. Yeah, maybe one more practical reason why these were located in rural communities. Exactly, yeah. 
less expensive, and the labor, the, the, the labor to staff is cheap, right? But then we have another problem all of a sudden. They start decommissioning the prisons, these work camp prisons, in this fragile labor relationship, this one thing that you know, some people in the community could depend on is gone again, right? So it's created all kinds of social issues, and, and rural communities adjust and recover, right? Um, but this is, this is a problem. So this was just sitting there for almost a decade. And I'll tell you the story. I don't think Norrin, um, I know I've heard Norrin tell the story out loud. So this is the background. Um, one of the, uh, he was working in the city um, as a behavioral um, mental health therapist, the city of Laurenburg. Um, and he's really working on the legal end of, of dealing with youth who are entering the juvenile system. And he, was, he had gotten to know this young man. Um, I believe he was 18 or 19 at this point. Um, he was like, we're going to get him over the line. Like, we're going to get him out, right? It was going to, you know, one small success. And sometime in that two-year relationship, it was around a two-year deliberate relationship that Norrin formed with this young man. Um, the kid ends up, I believe, assassinated on his front lawn by some other child in the community. He's like, I can't do it anymore. Like, what am I doing? But we're like, we're, I was almost there, and this young man is shot down in his front yard. What am I going to do? And so they buried him, and there were other youth gathered around at this time. And he says he was driving through, and he looked up, and he was like, well, dang, that decommissioned prison up there. What are they doing with that? And he started digging around, and sure enough, it had been sitting there for about a decade. And he went and started asking questions of people in various positions of legal authority. And he find, they said, well, if, and he had this idea, I'll assemble a youth team. We can get out from these offices where I'm, have, I'm doing this therapy, and we will do therapy sessions up at the prison. All right? We're going to reclaim the prison as a community center that was once used for dominating people and exploiting their labor, right? And that's not to say that the people whose labor was being exploited hadn't done some egregious things in the community that needed to be addressed, but he's thinking through this, right? And so that's the provenance of the prison itself. So he assembles this youth leader team, um, and their mission is to make visible this history in many ways, the history of the work camp prison um, that led to Scotland County Correctional. Right, so part, part of their work is doing public-facing stuff. Um, I'm here as a representative of that work uh, today in many ways because I've been involved with it. But they also want to instill hope, uh, and that's a, that's a crucial thing, hope, um, in the people in these rural communities that are suffering, right? And I, out of my own religious resources, I, I really can't think of hope apart from um, theology, right? Hope comes from something that's either out in front of me or that's been disciplined within me, right, to hope that the things that I've experienced or uh, the, the problems that I face are not the final word um, about me. So let me just end with a couple of, um, excuse me, a couple of thoughts on the, what, what hope means in the work of Grow and Change. So I've written about this. Um, part of what hope means is remembering Okay, think about that word, remember. Now, normally that means what I just said, to remember the history of the work camp prison in North Carolina, to acknowledge that prison labor, uncompensated prison labor, built those good roads of North Carolina and to own it with all of its political entanglements and its embarrassment and ethical issues bound up with it. So we need to remember that, right? Um, and to put it in that very, you know, whatever kind of canned, uh, predictable way. If we don't remember it, we're going to, you know, whatever, repeat it in some other mode or fashion, right? Well, we're doomed to do it again. The other aspect of remember is to put back together. If you think about remembering, it means putting things back together again. So they also remember the members of the youth team, helping them put their lives back together that have been taken from them either by from the time they set foot in kindergarten being put in detention and taken out of the classroom or set off from their classmates to help them put their life back together or to help them reflect on the family systems that they come from that are incredibly traumatized and, and, and dysfunctional. Right? How do you put that back together? That's the work of the therapy. 
But I think there's also a deeper religious um, resonance to the work of remembering too. And it takes two forms. Um, I'm going to call it transformational hope. So transformational hope um, is what growing change does. And transformational hope looks like human liberation as the reclamation of common space, the prison grounds that were once conceived of and designed for domination and social control, that it's the liberation and reclamation of that land for community development, for communities to come back together again and no longer be literally segregated by prison wall. Now that transformational hope practically, this is a really interesting thing about how um, Mr. Sanford does his work and the youth um, and the leadership team. They do not, this isn't totally true, but in general, they try not to purchase outside materials for the, the reconstruction of the prison space. They repurpose what's there. We're talking about razor wire, um, bolted beds that where the prisoners slept, a hot box where they would isolate people as further punishment. Um, I said razor wire, chain link fencing. They haven't taken any of that down because if you remove all that, you see what happens people will forget that there was a prison there. All right. Now, we, it's not simply a reminder, but they don't take the donations and use them towards necessarily towards just purchasing stuff from Lowe's and putting it in the ground, right, or, or cutting stuff down and scrapping it off. You're transforming, and, and, and in my religious tradition of Christianity, um, we reference the prophet Isaiah. He talks about beating um, implements of war into um, implements of peace, right? That, I think, is what's going on at Growing Change. They're taking these implements of domination and social control and turning them into implements for socializing and sociality. It's, it's, it's quite a beautiful thing. Um, if I had more time, I would talk about Mr. Sanford's own religious story. As part of the article I wrote, um, I interviewed him as part of an oral history to record the work of Growing Change um, and to dig a little bit deeper into his own uh, theological formation and religious background. It started in the United Methodist Church in Laurenburg, North Carolina. Um, but he would say this is absolutely accurate, what I'm describing, this, this idea of transformational hope. So um, let me just say a, a, a couple of final things about this, and then we can talk a little bit. Um, let me describe, since I started with political theology, let me describe what I think is going on with the work of Grow and Change. Number one, and, and I'm, I'm very compelled by this, in, in general, our religious traditions in America teach us to sort of think about it and maybe show up to synagogue or, or church or whatever one day a week. This is, doesn't go for everyone. And then kind of go back into our settled life and you know, do what we do in, in, our, in the polis, is it? Or, um, but this is really lived, action-based, sustained work. What, what Mr. Sanford and his youth team, what they do up and show, when they show up on the prison grounds and do the, the hard work, um, they're enacting theology in many ways. They're enacting a religious way of being in the world. They're enacting politics. People might have a, some questions about that, but I think that's what's going on. But this is very practice-based. So what are they doing? They're reclaiming and they're healing the land, um, as uh, Dr. Turner said. And I think this is a model that should be replicated across rural America. Like we've, it, it could be very context specific, right? It doesn't have to just be a prison, right? If we got our communities organized and thinking about what sorts of institutions existed here, right? And what were they for that have been gone, right? Um, how might we recover something of why they were here, right? For the sake of community, um, build, building community. I wonder um, what this vision might look like if, uh, if it took hold in other low-wealth, politically pressured parts of, rural, of the rural U.S. Um, I'll just put this as a series of questions. Who and what might be reclaimed in our communities? What kinds of stories, and this is really important, this idea of memory, what kind of stories might be resurrected to witness against the specter of trauma and the reality of death in our communities? that we don't ignore it, but we tell the story. Um, I'll close with, with this. While the nonprofit growing change is not totally unique in its efforts, 
It is the case that their vision for reclaiming, attaining, and sustaining the lives of young people by having them reclaim, attain, and sustain a brownfield site in rural North Carolina is something that the world of prison abolition and decarceral action has not seen before. I'll quote a, uh, a monument that stands on the, the campus of Growing Change, and it says this, um, if the work... what." This is my interpretation of it. If the work that I just described is to be collective, disciplined by hope, and humble in the face of struggle, then as the monument says, maybe we can imagine a world with no prisons. And that could become a reality in our own day and not just in the age to come. Um, but for now, we're going to have to wait and see what form that will take. So I hope that Growing Change's work can be lifted up. Um, I can draw attention to it. Um, through presentations like this and through uh, scholarly publications. Um, oftentimes, this does not get the attention it deserves because it exists in rural America, not just rural America, but the rural South. Um, that can often be forgotten. So some powerful stuff going on in Scotland County, North Carolina. Um, I hope it opens our imaginations up about how we can uh, scale this into our own community. So thanks for listening <laughs> this morning. and. I've enjoyed talking about it. We can have some questions or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the way that it, it's worked over the past decade or so, and I, I really wish Norrin was here because he can answer these questions in more precise detail, um, but they've largely been grant funded through a variety of organizations, most recently, I believe, through the Kellogg Foundation um, in Michigan, and they invested in a partnership between North Carolina A&T University and Growing Change um, to, to do some of the stuff that I've been talking about but uh, but yes there is broad community support I would say I was part of that um, I was trying to get students from my undergraduate institution involved in the work and they were like we held a harvest day um, one of the first things I did was we did a big harvest day celebration um, sometime in like October out at Grow and Change and my students were like painting pumpkins that were grown on the prison site and the community and we did like honeybee demonstrations and like any, I won't go into detail, but it was pretty cool. Um, composting, vermiculture, vermicast. Um, but Norrin would tell you there's been resistance as well. Um, the prison sits against a few farms uh, that, as I understand it, have had some questions about what's going on um, on the, the site. So it's not without some pushback, <laughs> to put it. Mildly, but that's a good question. Yeah. No, not currently. I mean, it's almost exclusively grant funded. Like their operation budget comes from outside donations, um, family foundations, and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things I'm going to be working on with them on is doing some actual theological education through my new institution on the prison grounds around vermicasting. Um, this is worms eating trash to create compost, and we can use that as a way of thinking about transformation, right, and, and life cycles and, that, and creation care and this kind of thing, but we're going to be giving them a donation to start this project. So um, part of it is we'll see. We'll see if they can get profitable to where they are generating an income that would be put back into the organization. But for now, I mean, what I've experienced is that uh, the, the situations of many of the young people take up so much time and effort, you know, so the prison's really the, um, the kind of classroom, right, that they're, they're playing with and interacting with the animals and that kind of thing more so than generating a, a profit. But the hope, of course, is to get there. Um, yeah. And are these yeah, yeah, um, um, yeah, in almost all cases. And when I first started working with them, um, I believe the whole youth team had had some encounter with juvenile justice, 
which I, if I remember correctly from what Mr. Sanford told me, um, they had all spent some kind of time in state incarceral spaces. So, and the deal that he was making was if they can come and work with me, they would have their time expunged or, or, or reduced or whatever. It's basically community service, I think. So, yeah. Right now, the youth team is nine um, working with them, which is about what he can handle, um, nine to ten. I believe the ideal would be 12 at any given time rotating through, but right now the youth team is is, is at nine um, young men from, a couple from Hoke, mostly from Scotland County, though, so, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so the youngest who I have seen would have probably been in the seventh or eighth grade. He's no longer with the group. That's been six or seven years ago now. So I, I, I middle school to high school, and then if he can get him through uh, high school, I, I believe he's had a 100% college placement, right? But this comes through other support systems too, but having that kind of community, um, Y'all, we could fact check me on that, but I believe um, that he's got a 100% placement um, for his young people. So, pretty impressive. Now, dads who have completed the program, um, some, like this young man I'm thinking of who started in middle school, he dropped out and I, I think he's gone back through, you know, recidivism as they call it, you know, problems with reentry. Yeah. No, they live around the county. That's the, the deal. So a lot of it um, for Mr. Sanford is transporting these young men to and from, but their families are involved too. Like they'll come, you know, and uh, uh, none that I know of, not through the organization growing change. Yeah, this is really direct action with their, their young people. Yeah, and then I'll go over. Who holds the deed to the buildings and the land? The, yeah, the North Carolina Department of Transportation still does, I believe. Yeah, so the state still owns the, I think he leases it for like a dollar a year or something like that. But there was at one time, like three or four years ago, a proposal out there that they would turn it over to him. But I don't know where that's at right now. And a lot of that has to do with the makeup of the legislature, right? Like it changes, you know, periodically and, um, you know, the governor changes, and so that impacts. Yeah, on the prison camp, or I'm calling it's not a prison campus. On the the site, um, there is a facility with refrigerators and that kind of thing, so they have food. And a former professor from UNC Pembroke, um, she was in biology. Um, she would do a lot of. It was kind of her retirement project. She would do a lot of meal prep on site, but. Um, he also enjoys taking them out, you know, so they like that too. You know, but we're talking about like Zaxby's and that kind of thing. So, yeah. So what kind of garden facility do they have there? Are they growing things like the community or a farmer's market or whatever? Yeah, so the last, so COVID really put a, a full stop on <laughs> everything. So the field has laid fallow for a little while. Um, the last time they had uh, stuff in the ground, I haven't been out there this year. Yet, but for the to see if what they've got going on with the summer garden, but I mean, it was the traditional tomatoes, okra, squash, zucchini. Um, it was a fairly large garden plot, but what they were, a lot of it was just being given away. Um, there's another aspect of this work. Growing Change has a lot of community partners. During the pandemic, the youth team pivoted, if I can use that word, um, to working with this group called Ag Innovation out of Hamlet North. I believe they're in Hamlet. They're in Hamlet or Rockingham. Um, and they had federal funding for giving away fresh food boxes during the pandemic. Um, we helped with that a little bit too, but the youth team was delivering. So they still stayed engaged in that food delivery um, of fresh food. Um, actually at my church, um, they're starting a UPIC community garden. Um, it's at Trinity Presbyterian Church and Growing Change is putting in a garden plot um, for this little neighborhood of, uh, of, Scott, of Laurenburg where people can just show up in any time and, and pick. So, but no, no farmer's markets or anything like that. It's a good question. Yes. So do the kids come every day or is it just every day? So it's like school. Yeah. Um, now some of them, most of them are in a traditional school 
setting, but a lot of the work takes place over weekends and is like an after school program. But now some of the older youth leaders, he does have a few who were out of high school. Um, they are they are there almost all day working them, you know, kind of nine to, to five kind of thing with them. But that might be in the hoop house, like the greenhouse or something like that, or it might be um, on the site. Yeah. Yeah. And leadership and political support. Yeah. I mean, part of it, I have this in my notes, but part of a question I have is do we have the political will to support people who might want to do this work? Um, Noren's heart is really in it because he's from Laurenburg and he loves Laurenburg, you know. But we have a lot of uh, prison abolitionists, if I can call them that, or decarceral activists um, who may not be from Haywood County, but would like to go there. But then you've got this whole problem of people from the outside coming in. You know, I mean, this is difficult stuff. So I think part of it is political will and just community organizing. Um, but part of it is finding ways to lift up the leaders in our communities, right? Our young people who could lead this work. But I mean, we're, the, the hope is that Growing Change's model would be scalable. That's the goal. Um, I think we have a human resources issue, not so much a financial resources issue. If we could find 100 good activists, um, and they might not like to be called that, but it, but that's the trick, right? Um, and that's why I'm talking, I, I want people to hear this and say, this is something I could do. But very briefly, the Kellogg grant um, was uh, given to help write what they're calling the prison flip toolkit and it's an open source, uh, open resource that can be given to, and the state of Michigan was interested in it because they have either the first highest or the second highest amount of decommissioned prisons in the U.S. North Carolina and Michigan are one and two, so. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would like to. They're <laughs> clearly there. No, that's right. I mean, I was like, well, thank goodness. Maybe we didn't incarcerate people at that Right. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, there are thirty-eight thousand prisoners. When I looked um, a few weeks ago in the state of North Carolina, I don't know about South Carolina. Yes. Was there a, an initiative to decommission the prisons? Was it a what caused that? Yeah. Um, this is in the article, and I've forgotten the the stat. There was an initiative that they need. So what was being reckoned? It was it was expensive to run these things. Um, it kind of, it was just a, a sort of bare economic calculation, I think, uh, from what I understand. And they consolidated them into places like Butner. Um, I believe there's a correctional facility in Durham. There is one still in Robinson County. So it was kind of like you close all the small rural county schools and you consolidate into a county high school. It's a terrible metaphor, but you, you see what I'm saying. That's, I think that was the logic. And that all happened right around late 90s, early 2000s when these new reforms were happening, but Michelle Alexander, for example, the new Jim Crow, she writes about the, you know, this new problem of mass incarceration, and this is part of it. This is a tentacle in the mass incarceration um, wing of our political life together. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, do they, do the our youth come as from a referral then? Yes. Um, and I believe it's still that now there is some youth recruitment where he has gone in and said to like the early college high school and said, do you want to work together? You know, these could be your friends or whatever. But in general, it comes through referral. And he still I believe has a tie in through his you know mental health license with the state. Um, so people will come to him and say, we need you to you know maybe do like a few sessions with this young person. And maybe they become a really good fit for growing change. So he recruits them into the program. Yeah. So there's recruitment and referral. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. Has anybody thought about contacting our state magazine and have them do an article? Or yeah. I mean, NPR, he's gotten some international attention. He was in Amsterdam a few years ago talking about this. Um, the Europeans were very interested in it. Um, they don't have the same issues that we have in the United States. I don't know if our state has done anything, but uh, 
UNCW, or I'm, I'm sorry, WUNC, uh, the radio affiliate, um, they did a series on them. You can, there's some really good online, just look up Grow and Change, Larn, or, you know, Scotland County, North Carolina, and you'll find, um, a lot, but I, that's a great, I'll ask him about that and see if we have any contacts at our state. Um, Cause that kind of public exposure to describe the works crucial. Yeah. There's the hospital, the college, St. Andrews. We got one in Atlanta, so. Scotia, yeah, right, right behind. Yeah, it's, I, I was just driving my parents out there around there the other uh, yesterday, but um, or two days. Yeah, no, yesterday I was at Scotia, but um, yeah, it's pretty slim pickings. I mean, the uh, what was there was some pharmaceutical chemical manufacturing. This is before my time. Textile, obviously and a lot of that from the 70s to the early 2000s systematically pulled out. Um, so it's, it's tough. Um, and we're an hour and a half from everything, Raleigh, Durham, Wilmington, Charlotte. So you can't live there and commute or it's really difficult, but um, it's, a, it's an, an entanglement. But it's also a beautiful community too. Um, I, I love living there. Um, it's a wonderful place. So. Yeah, good. Well, thanks, y'all. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Tanner Caps, and thank y'all so much for those that very active engagement, the wonderful Q&A. Great way to end uh, our foul first Thursday. Thanks again to our friends of the Waccamaw Mall Library. Uh, and if you're not a friend, still time to sign up quickly before they leave. And we'll, we'll see you again in September. Great. Thanks.